within the 40 minutes. So uh, I'm Graham Butcher. I'm chairing this session uh, just on the, on the, on the Lucerne. Um, I have a timekeeper here somewhere, I think. Oh, there you go. Jolly good. Um, can we have the nod at 10 to 2? Get your big stick out. Timekeeper. Do what you have to do. Um, I probably everyone here knows Derek anyway. He's an extremely well-known scientist based up at Lincoln, been there since 1996. And he's the go-to man when it comes to Lucerne and subclover. We'll touch on subclover, but mostly talking about Lucerne. Um, who hasn't heard Derek speak before? No, oh, a few more than I would Most have of you should be doing the talk then. <laughs> so anyway, we'll get straight into it. We're going to have a 10-minute session at the end. But are you happy to take, take clarifications questions, yeah. all the way through? We have this, this little innovation here. If you've got a question, put your hand up. I'll throw this at you. You have to catch it. Put it into the black dot. All right? I won't throw it fast or hard. So I'll hand it over to Derek. Um, you don't need that there, do you? No. Nope. This is all yours. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for coming. Um, what I thought I'd do today is actually, I'm going to talk about Lucerne, but really what I'm going to talk about is how I got onto Lucerne and what the principles of it are, and try and, I know that the audience here is not a true Lucerne audience, some of you are not actually in areas that would be conducive to Lucerne, but the principles that we talk about hopefully are um, appropriate for all of the, the, the farming systems that we work with. I'm just going to work out if I can dot. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a tricky one, isn't it? Um, what I'm going to do is give you some information. So when I operate, what I'm doing are called on-station experiments. So my postgraduate students, they do good research that has great data integrity, and farmers consider that of low currency and relevance. So generally the results that come out of a, a, a field experiment done at Lincoln or done at Massey, um, farmers go, well, that's interesting, but it didn't happen on my farm. That's, that's the, the tendency for that sort of thing. So what we try and do is, well, I actually have to do that, and the students have to do that because we want good quality data. But when it becomes more relevant is when we get down here and we have some case studies. So case studies are um, often for farmers, what happened in their region or a farmer they relate to becomes of high relevance, so high currency and relevance here. Um, but for me trying to publish in journals, it's got low data integrity. So I can't actually talk to other scientists with those case studies because they're not considered to have really good controls. So what we're doing as scientists is trying to operate from up here, way down to here, to get things to happen. No um, personal opinion here has low currency and relevance and low data integrity. So you may think you know everything, but actually unless it's got some science behind it, um, it probably isn't that good. And I'm not sure where we'd put Donald Trump on that particular diagram. Myths and legends maybe over here? I don't know, in his own mind. So what I'm going to try and do is give you a little bit of data to say, look, this is, this is what I base things on, but then try and give you a few case studies of people that have implemented some of the things we've talked about and some of the results that they've got from doing so. Um, this is me. You can spot me here as a callow youth, look. And I did wear shorts, and I don't show my students that, but that's pretty much how many of my students look at the moment. So I finished, I did some farming at Belclutha for part of my prac work, and I finished, and I went overseas, and I was given a book when I left, it was called The Village Pub. So we visited 87 village pubs in England, my wife and I, it was fantastic. Um, got us off the main roads, but what I was doing there was actually working on climate change, and that was 20, 22 many years ago, 22, 23 years ago. And at that time, people were just starting to measure carbon dioxide levels and start to think about whether climate change was going to occur. And as a young scientist, I went, well, I've not really heard much about this, so I did some investigation and thought, yeah, actually, I think this is real. I was working out whether we could grow wheat in Spain or not anymore, what was going to happen in 25 years. So that was what I was you know, doing my research on. Um, and then I came home and I was given a brief. One of the nice things about a university is you're given a brief. We don't care what you do research on, just do something. <coughs> Very nice brief to be given. And that's what it was. And I said, well, if I put climate change with farming, actually in New Zealand, the predicted biggest impact is on the east coast of New Zealand. It's from central Otago through to Hawke's Bay. That's where climate change is supposed to have the biggest impact. And more importantly, actually they're already coping with the greatest variability of climate of anywhere in New Zealand anyway. They cope with years of rainfall, no rainfall, 
um, cold, wet, the whole lot. So I didn't really talk about climate change for 20 years and some people, I don't, still don't talk about it with them, but I talk about trying to cope with the variability that occurs um, from farming on the east coast of New Zealand. And, and so that's what I did. I said, well, let's work on that. The other thing was there was no one really working on anything but ryegrass and white clover when I came home 25 years ago. So I thought, well, I'll do something different. Um, everything we do is actually on our dryland website. So if you're looking for information from um, my research team, it's basically at Lincoln University slash dryland. And I'll put this presentation there as well. And it'll just have today's date and gore on it. So you'll be able to um, have a look at that if you want to as well. The first experiment I ever did, um, those of you that heard me speak before will recognise this. It was very simple. We got a, a, a coxfoot pasture and we said, well, what actually makes plants grow? Here's our normal coxfoot. Let's add all the water we can to it. So we've just bought $10,000 worth of centre pivot irrigator. Um, or let's add all the nitrogen we can to it here. Or let's add irrigation and nitrogen here. And so that's what we did. And we looked, there was a nine-year-old one, a coxfoot stand. So it didn't have a lot of legume in it, and it was pretty grass dominant. But the results actually have transferred when we've gone and worked on bromes and ryegrasses and tall fescue. The same thing happened. That's pretty much what the average growth rate for the dry land pasture was. It was about six and a half tonnes of dry matter that we got. When we just added water, we took that to 10 tonnes. Now, if you've just spent a lot of money converting to a dairy farm, that's not a great change in the amount of yield that you get. What interested me was that one. When we gave those pastures all the nitrogen they needed, we went from six and a half tonnes to 16 tonnes. So that highlighted how nitrogen deficient those pastures were. The consequence of, um, of that line is that farmers recognised that water wasn't their main limitation in Canterbury. Now remember, this is Canterbury 20 years ago. All those dry land farms being converted into centre pivot irrigators, actually the main limitation wasn't water, it was nitrogen. And so to produce 22 tonnes of dry matter, that's what they actually do, is they add nitrogen and water to get 22 tonnes of dry matter. That's pretty much what's happened. If we, if we look at this graph, and you look at the blue line at the top, this line here has all the water it wanted and all the nitrogen it wanted. So the only thing that's causing it to go up and down is temperature. And if I account for temperature, I can do that. I simply um, account for temperature, and instead of saying that today is Thursday, I accumulate how much temperature we get today. And if I do that, I can get my 22 tonnes of dry matter and say that that pasture grew 7 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per temperature unit that it accumulated. Okay, so that's the 22 tonnes, and I've got rid of the wiggly line. And this one here is the irrigated one that had no nitrogen. So it's produced 3.5 kilos of dry matter. So that's the nitrogen gap. That's what was missing in those um, pastures. That was the potential yield gap that we have in those dry land pastures. So what's happened to nitrogen applied in New Zealand? Well, that's what's happened to nitrogen applied in New Zealand because people started doing this around here and recognised that if I put water on, I'm not really getting much of a response. So we have increased our um, nitrogen footprint, our nitrogen use quite dramatically um, in recent times. With that, nitrogen production is a very inefficient process, so we produce a huge amount of carbon dioxide. It's an energy intensive process, but I'm not bagging nitrogen because without it, we wouldn't have seven and a half billion people on the planet. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing um, doesn't matter. Until the 1950s, there were about two billion people on the planet. After that, with nitrogen fertilizer, it's allowed the population to increase exponentially. Prior to that, the Haber-Bosch process, which produces the nitrogen, if you looked at farming in the 1920s, it wouldn't have been much different from the 1820s or the 1720s. It's really the advent of nitrogen that allowed us to grow wheat crops, it allowed us to industrialise um, rice production, that has allowed the growth of what people now call um, industrial agriculture. So that's what happens, and that's the urea use in Canterbury. Since about 2002, it's gone up on average 8,500 tonnes per year, every year. Okay? Now, you can shake your head when you look at that, but if you look at the previous graph, you can understand why that's happened. Because they put water on, and nothing grew. Because actually what was limiting their production and what limits their production all the time, and what limits every plant's production is nitrogen. 
If I haven't got nitrogen, I don't grow. So what we now have is the difficulty of we've still got yellow nitrogen deficient pastures all over Canterbury and 1,000 kilos of N de deposited from a urine patch causing us environmental problems. So there's a real dilemma on how we deal with this issue. But actually we've still got N deficient pastures and if you drive around Southland in the spring and you see those urine patches, that's the yield potential that you're missing. That's the gap that's occurring. One of the other things that happens as we add um, nitrogen fertiliser is we stop nitrogen fixation. So this is lucerne and white clover and what happened to them as we increased nitrogen fertiliser application. This is the percentage of their nitrogen that they derived free from the atmosphere. How much did they fix with nitrogen fixation? So all of it when they've got no fertiliser and then it decreases down as we increase the fertiliser rate. So if we put a lot of nitrogen on, we suppress the nitrogen fixation, we also give the advantage to the grass and we end up with very grass dominant pastures. Natural state of affairs. And now the dairy industry in Canterbury, a lot of the time it is um, when the cows leave the paddock, they call the urea truck in. And, and I don't have any issue with that because that actually makes sense biologically. But what I was trying to get at was this one, do I really want to be doing that or can I get the dryland farmers to get somewhere between the six and a half they've got now and the 16 that's possible by having nitrogen in the system? And the way to do that, um, if, we look at, sorry, if we look at that from a summer perspective, I'll just go back to that graph there, you can see in both of these cases we've got a dry period through the summer. If I account for that summer, By looking at the moisture response, what you find is, here's my seven kilos of dry matter per hectare for the greasy day and my 22 tonnes of dry matter. In the spring, if I've got water and I have nitrogen in the system, that pasture that grew 15 tonnes of dry matter is growing as fast as the one because it's exactly the same. It's got nitrogen and it's got water. And then it runs out of water. Now, plants are not that clever. I don't know if any of you have spoken to them recently, but they don't really talk back that well. They don't know they're running out of water. So what they do is grow as fast as they possibly can and then bang, they run out of water. And that's why you've got a flat line there. So we ran out of water. And then the slope of this is pretty much the same as the slope of this. So here's, I can't do much about it, but there's huge potential for me to grow feed in spring when I've got water and in autumn when I've got water if I have nitrogen in the system because nitrogen is used at the same rate, uh, water is used at the same rate whether the pasture has nitrogen or not. So this shows you what a bucket of water looks like. Here's my bucket of water and it's full. This is basically your soil profile on your farm when you've got field capacity, so it's wet. And then we use the water as we go through the um, summer period and then we get dry and we've got a little bit of rainfall happening so we come up a bit, a bit more rainfall and then at the end of the season hopefully we've filled the bucket again. That's a dryland rain fed sort of system. But both the dryland plus nitrogen and the dryland without nitrogen pastures use that bucket of water at about the same rate. Because the use of water is driven by physics. It's driven by the humidity, the wind speed and the temperature. And you know the use of water because you've heard that today we're going to lose five millimetres of evapotranspiration. All that's saying is how much water are we losing from the system? We're losing five mils of water. And every day we lose some water. Not five mils if you've got nitrogen and two mils if you haven't. It's five mils. That's what the evapotranspiration is on any given day, driven by temperature, wind speed and, and um, humidity. And that's what's going to happen. So that pretty much says I can use lots of water efficiently, the same bucket of water, sorry, efficiently or not, depending on whether I have N in the system. <coughs> so what that means is this patch here and this patch here are using the water at the same rate. Is that clear? All right? So my philosophy was, well, if I know that, can I get dryland pastures to be more efficient than what they currently are? Because we know we have a limited water supply, we know nitrogen makes plants grow, we know we've got to meet animal demand, particularly during lactation, and we know that we can grow more feed in spring if we have some nitrogen in the system. We want to minimise impact on air and water, be productive and profitable, 
and socially acceptable? And my answer was, well, I think we can do that with legumes. And it wasn't that new, because when I was a student, that was what I was taught. It sort of changed a bit, but well, how do we make the system actually operate? So when I started working, there was, I'd been taught about lucerne when I was a student at Lincoln by um, uh, a professor, Professor Langer, the late Professor Langer, who died last week. Um, but I'd been taught about lucerne. I came back to New Zealand, no one was talking about it. So can we use legumes? So legumes fix about 25 to 30 kilos of nitrogen per tonne of legume that you grow. And that doesn't matter if it's beans, or it's peas, or it's gorse, or it's white clover, or it's lucerne, or subclover, about 25, 30 kilos of nitrogen fixed for nothing from the atmosphere for every tonne of legume that you grow. That's what you get put into your system, okay? And we also know that high feeding value pastures look like that. They're leafy, there's not a lot of dead material, there's a lot of dicot, a lot of um, legume in there and a little bit of grass. So that's what we're looking for. And we also know that if we want to grow animals fast, and I had to grow them fast, 300 grams per head per day or more, then I have to actually have an ME of 12. And the only pastures that do that are mostly clover pastures, good quality lucerne, rape pasture, or better than that, mother's milk. If I get the national average of around 150 odd grams per head per day, really what I'm dealing with is average ryegrass growing pasture of an ME of about 10. Now for my dryland systems, I've got a graph later, but for a lot of the people I work with, they had to get a lamb from birth to slaughter in 100 days, because they've only got three months of growth. September, October, November, or October, November, December, and then it's dry. So they either sell stores and get hit by a store market, or they've got to grow animals quicker. So if you think about that, if I have a five kilo birth weight and I want to get to 35 kilo um, live weight to finish, I've got to put on 300 grams per head per day over 100 days. That's just the numbers, that's just what it says. And to do that, I therefore need high quality pastures. And we also know that animals like to eat legumes. Given a choice, they'll eat 70% legume, 30% grass. So when we put them in a paddock and there's not very, very much legume, that's what they go and eat. So we constantly put pressure on the legume, put them on a hill block, constantly it's the legume that gets eaten. So over time our hill blocks start to deteriorate in terms of their production. Because the thing they'll eat when they target, and particularly use, they will target the high protein, they'll target that, that legume. So I asked around why people weren't using lucerne um, at that time and got a few answers. And so what I've got here is a, a precy of some of the results of the research that we've done in getting the lucerne system operating. Now I don't care whether it's um, red clover and plantain or it's subclover or it's white clover or what it is that might work in your farm system, the principles are pretty much the same. It's a legume that will drive production. It's a legume that the ewe requires um, just pre-lambing and, and as they're lambing, because that's when the greatest demand is coming on. And any animal that's losing weight during that time is an animal that's harder to put back, weight back on. You've got to put more feed back into them before you take them through to tuffing the following year. So high quality feed is very important through that early lactation period. From an establishment perspective, lucerne does best on free draining soils with the same sort of pH and, and, and fertility as ryegrass white clover. We sow about 10 kilos per hectare um, and we use peat inoculated seed, particularly if you're putting in um, a lucerne stand into an area that hasn't had one before, then you need the inoculant. For a lot of our legumes, red clover, white clover, there's actually the bacteria that will fix nitrogen floating in the atmosphere here now. And if you sow them into the ground, they'll actually grow pretty well. Um, we generally spring sow, occasionally we autumn sow, and we generally cultivate or direct drill. Now lucerne can be successfully direct drilled. If you are direct drilling anything, if it's swedes or it's lucerne, whatever it is, you should be thinking about using something like diammonium phosphate. One of the things that direct drilling does is it doesn't mineralise nitrogen to give those plants a kick off, because you're not actually um, turning the soil over. So a little bit of phosphorus is very important when you're establishing a swede crop, for example, particularly if you're 
um, direct drilling. It's, it becomes really important. The worse the root system, the more important the phosphorus becomes. Phosphorus is the energy source for plants. Because what we're trying to do with a lucerne stand is grow a decent tap root. And this one's one and a half metres long after eight months. So, you know, it's growing about a centimetre a day. That one actually came out of um, Pleasant Point. It was sent to me by a farmer when they had a flood there a few years ago. And it washed away a part of his paddock and he sent me, sent me through a, a picture of his plant. Um, in central Otago, those of you who have grown, uh, dr driven through there, you'll see there's quite a big change in that. So one of the key things we've done there is autumn spraying. Really important if you've got a wet autumn and you've got brown top dominant pastures or you've got Californian thistles you're trying to kill, that's the time to do it. The autumn is the critical time because the plants are taking sugar down from the top to the roots. So that's an autumn thing that really happens every year. And pretty much, we've got, yeah, we've got some willow trees over there. That's what deciduous trees do. They take the nitrogen out of the leaves and they store it in the trunk or they store it in the roots. And they store nitrogen because they can't make nitrogen. But it's the nitrogen that makes the leaf green that allows photosynthesis to happen. So our deciduous trees actually take that nitrogen out of the leaves they turn lovely yellow and red and all sorts of colours, but it's the nitrogen they're storing and waiting for next year. So does the brown top. So does the Californian thistle. If you want to control Cali thistles, top them in the spring, weed wipe them in the autumn with a translocatable herbicide. That's when they'll be taking sugars down. So the key thing here, this is low rainfall obviously, is to conserve moisture and kill the root mass. Second spraying in the spring, this, these are really you know, dead. And this is just direct drilled. So that's an autumn spray that's then been um, second sprayed in the spring, again with some insecticide, and then drilled. And the drilling here is the lucerne's been direct drilled in here, seed plus fertilizer. And that fertilizer is the phosphorus. Phosphorus is what's keeping you warm at the moment. It's the energy source for all of us. And for plants, it's the energy source for them to do photosynthesis, and it's the energy source for them to do nitrogen fixation. So plants actually need phosphorus. That's why we do superphosphate. But here we're just talking about banding it below the plant and giving that plant a good kick off when it gets going. One of the other issues that comes up is people get concerned about carbon, soil carbon. Everyone wants soil carbon. I don't want soil carbon. Okay, this is organic matter, this is a thatch sitting on top of soil. I don't mind the soil carbon down here, but this carbon here actually stops nutrient cycling. So one of the problems when you get a thick thatch of brown top or a buildup of um, material on the top of your pasture is it's difficult to establish in here. You've got to get rid of that. I can't put a seed in here and expect it to grow. But that's often the thatch we have when we're breaking in new land. So we've got to get rid of that thatch. And we, we might use a, a rye corn crop or something like that to be able to do that. That's one of the reasons that these cereal crops work so well when we're breaking in thatchy land, is that we put a seed. And what we're doing in that case is we can put a rye corn seed at depth through this. I can't put a clover seed in here, and I can't put it down here because it's too deep, it won't come up. But a big cereal will go in there, and it'll then come up. So the cereal crop in that case is being used to break down that organic matter. And often farmers that put in their rye corn crop or their oat crop or whatever it might be, find that the first year crop isn't very good. And the reason it's not very good is because they're generally putting nitrogen on to grow this crop, but the nitrogen's being used by the, by the microbes to break down this carbon. Because you've got to have nitrogen in the system to get the breakdown of that carbon. So we lose some of that nitrogen. But then if we break feed this through the winter, we return some urine, and then that urine helps, and the second year crop is generally much better. So in a, a dry situation, that's the way we've predominantly been breaking in that sort of land. From establishment um, in in cultivated areas in Canterbury, we'll sow in about October and we'll get our first crop in December and we graze it if it's weedy um, and then we start rotational grazing. We don't need it to flower. If it does, that's great, but we don't need lucerne to be flowering as we're um, rotationally grazing it. The key thing is to be patient. And I'm not going to go through all the technical details of this. If you've got specific questions around this, 
we can do it, but in 40 minutes I can't give you a how we do Lucerne ABC. I just want to give you some principles. Some other principles, um, growth is what we call kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day. Okay, so we need to understand that growth is about catching light. And one thing to keep in your head is that light is instantaneous. If I don't catch the light today, it's not there tomorrow. The soil moisture is, I can conserve that for tomorrow, and I can conserve the nutrients for tomorrow. But light is instantaneous. You either capture it or you lose it. So capturing light becomes really important because light is the driver of kilograms of dry matter per hectare. Most of you think kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day, what do I, what's my growth rate? Actually what you're talking about is how much photosynthesis happened today. How much carbon was made? How much sugar did we make? Okay, and then um, and to do that, you've got to capture light. And then development is when the plants flower. When do they produce leaves? And those things are driven by temperatures. They're driven by the same sorts of things, and they're influenced by environmental signals. Plants can tell time, and they tell it by the day length. How did the willow tree know to drop its leaves? Because the days were getting shorter. Okay, so that's how they're telling the time. So that's our energy capture device. Whenever I don't have a canopy of leaves, then I'm losing light from the system. And one of the issues we have in spring is we have our pastures so short that actually we are losing light from the system because if they're completely short, they're not capturing all of the light that's available. If I, I just wanted to illustrate that. If I've got a meter squared, that area here, and I've got it completely covered in the ground, I have what's called a leaf area index of one. One unit of green leaf, per one meter of green leaf per meter of ground. To capture all of the available light, I actually need about three and a half meters of green leaf for every meter of ground. So I actually need the leaves to be up a little bit to be capturing and intercepting the light because there's generally more light available for us than the plants have the ability to capture. So we've got to capture all of that light. What we found with the lucerne was that if we irrigated the crop and we had a mean temperature of 12 in the spring, it's growing about 60 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day. But in the autumn, it's still irrigated, it's still capturing all of the light, but it's only growing 35 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day. So this is, these are, it's got nitrogen because it's a legume. So we set about trying to work out why do we get this big difference in growth rates between spring and autumn. So this was a um, PhD student's job at, at Lincoln and we had crops that we grazed, um, gave them 38 days resting and four days grazing, or crops that we grazed after 25 days and only gave them three days of, of resting. The experiment doesn't matter too much. What matters is what happened below ground. So this is the start of the spring and I've got about three tonnes of biomass below ground because we don't often think about what's happening below ground. But below ground, the lucerne stand, and I suspect the red clover and the chicory, have this mass of carbon and nitrogen stored. And then they use that and transport it up, and therefore we get high growth rates. Hence, we get those higher growth rates that I showed you in the spring. And then in the autumn, and for the plants, there's only spring and autumn. Plants only register when the days are getting longer and when the days are getting shorter, that's how they tell the time. And if they do that, then at the end of the season, this crop had got back to its three tons of dry matter and looked pretty good. So it was doing very well. But the consequence of that, if I was only measuring above ground, was that this that's being put under the ground makes it look like it's got a lower growth rate. So the difference between these two lines is that really the mean is about here this is from stuff coming from below ground up, Californian thistles exploding in the spring. This is from sugar being put under the ground into the rhizomes and into the roots going down. That's when I put my herbicide on the Cali thistles and get them because they're taking it down. So lucerne is doing that. Once we understood that, the same thing happening if we don't, if we don't look after the lucerne stand, the same thing happened in the second treatment, but we killed that crop in two years because we never gave it a rest in the autumn. It needs a rest to get back to three tonnes to be perennial. So what that taught us was we can be much more flexible with grazing a lucerne stand than we ever thought we could be. So we now graze 
a lucerne stand. I have people that are grazing lucerne stands that are about 10 centimetres tall in the spring. They will start when the first paddock in their rotation is about that big. Okay, now I used to be told when I was a student, you wait for 10% flowering. Sometimes the crops were this, but who's heard that, 10% flowering? Okay, that's what I got told. And this set of data I've just shown you is my scientific explanation for no, we don't. We can start when the lucerne's quite small. We can start rotational grazing on that, or we can actually, we have some people who um, at a low stocking rate are actually set stocked on that because they've got so much lucerne on their property if they didn't have some animals on it during spring and when it's just starting to kick off, they'd, they'd run out of room. So we can graze before flowers appear, ideally with ewes and lambs. The growing point is at the top of the plant, so once I remove that growing point, the growing point of a plant is the bit that produces the leaves. It's also the bit that tells the temperature. Okay? So the growing point's at the top. Now with the grass, that growing point is below ground. So it pokes the leaves above ground, and therefore I can set stock grasses. Because if I remove the leaf, another one will pop up because the, the point, the growing point, the bit that produces the leaf is protected and it's below ground. With lucerne, it's at the top of the plant. So if I take it off, it has to start and produce a whole new one from, from that crown of um, shoots that it's got. So that's why we rotationally graze lucerne and we can set stock grasses. So here we're looking at a stand um, pre-grazing. Now I've got that at 20 to 25 centimetres tall as being the first paddock that we're grazing in September. We've now shifted this down. We're actually at Lincoln grazing um, often the first week of September and we're on to 10 to 15 centimetres. Okay? So it then becomes a really viable option because we're using it early in the spring. This one looks like it's 10 to 15 centimetres because the photo's been taken on an angle. Um, but that's what a grazing rotation looks like. So this is that first paddock. It's got about two tonnes of dry matter. Second paddock we go into, third paddock, fourth paddock, fifth paddock, sixth paddock, because we're rotationally grazing around the paddocks. That all looks pretty good, and I've come back here, and I've got paddock one, two, and three at about three tonne, about 30 centimetres, which is perfect for going back in for the second rotation. Perfect height to be going in, 25, 30 centimetres, 30 centimetres tall. But look, these ones here got away on me. So they'd be paddocks that I probably should be dropping out of the rotation and cutting and carrying. So what we, in an experimental situation, very difficult to do that, but if I'd shifted this set of lines down a bit, which is what we're doing now, then actually all of these come down a bit and I no longer have to drop those out. So I'm maximising the feed that's actually going into the animals. So we're starting grazing at about 10 centimetres tall in the spring. And that's about um, 12 ewes plus twins per hectare is what we're starting on at about that point. So if I've got a 20 hectare block of lucerne and maybe I've got it split in, into five paddocks, that's 20 times 12 ewes plus twins per hectare, so it's 240 in a mob. Does that make sense? would have been an absolutely no problem at all time to start grazing, 22nd of August. That's a month earlier than we were starting when we first started doing this research. I'd be quite comfortable coming into this lucerne stand now, 22nd of August. Okay? So that's very, that's for me at Lincoln. But it's a month earlier than we ever were previously. 
Um, and then it grows, it continues to grow, and we grew some stuff that's 60 centimetres tall and you can't see a flower anywhere near it. So it's this big and there's no flowers. If I'm waiting for 10% flowering, what a waste. Okay, so the key message is, let's get onto the lucerne in the spring and look after it in the autumn. Um, triplets, happily grazing some lucerne grass here. And priority stock, um, lamb, beef, deer. We've got dairy cows grazing lucerne now. Once they're on it, they should stay on it, and we want to stay on a rotation um, with, those, with that mob of animals. If you haven't got lucerne and you'd like to have it, about 20 hectares is a good amount to start with, because it'll take your hogget mob, for example. Five hectares becomes a nuisance. Five hectares cut and carry. You know, but if you're just starting, 20 hectares is probably what you want to do and that'll give you the opportunity of having five, four hectare paddocks and being able to work some of this out and see, see whether it's going to work on your property. Um, high numbers for short periods of time, no more than seven to 10 days on any individual paddock, and then they're off. Um, these bulls are quite happily grazing with the ewes and lambs in early spring in Marlborough. A bit of fibres out there for them to eat and some salts available to them. Um, Lucerne stores salt or sodium in its roots so it needs sodium to be available. So it's just a normal salt lick gets put out whenever you're grazing lucerne. Needs some sodium out there. Um, one of the things that Doug Avery started to do, for those who don't know Doug Farms in Marlborough, um, is pre-graze mow when the lucerne's really lush in the spring. I have no scientific evidence to say if this is good or bad, but it seems to work. So instead of, um, oops, I'm going backwards. Go back, go back. Oh, it's not wanting to go back for me. Here we go. Instead of having to put the fibre out, if you've mown some strips, the animals will actually come in here and eat this. So that's the fibre. And because whatever we put out as hay is not going to be as high a quality as the stuff in the paddock, the animals will tend to not eat the hay. You can't get every animal to eat hay because it's not quite as good a quality and they'll always try and choose the highest quality feed. But if you have some strips like this, then this is actually just wilted for about 48 hours before the animals have gone in, and that deals with that lush lucerne that can be a problem um, in the very early spring. And you can see the bulls are in here eating the lucerne at the same time. Um, in the autumn, because we know it's putting stuff under the ground, we look after the plant. So what I'm trying to say is I think lucerne fits the breeding systems really well. We've got a lot of animals coming in the spring. It's producing a whole lot of carbohydrate coming up, producing more feed than it should based on how much light it's intercepted. But in the autumn, we've got to recognise it's going to slow down. And so in the autumn, we've got to give it a chance to build up those root reserves. And that means trying to let it have a flower or an extended period. And autumn is any time between the second week of um, January and the end of May. That gives you a pretty big window to get it right and go here, the stand needs a rest. Okay? And that way we can keep stands away, around for a while. In terms of quality, the ME of the leaf is always above 12, the ME of the stem is always about 8. The reason we're trying to graze at about 30 centimetres is because that's about 3 tonnes of biomass. If I graze 5 tonnes, I've got 2.5 tonnes of leaf and 2.5 tonnes of stem. If I graze two tons, I've got two tons of leaf and no stem. It's all highly palatable. There's about two and a half tons of good stuff in a lucerne stand, which is about 25, 30 centimetres tall. Now, if I'm making hay, I probably have to do 40 centimetres because I need that bit of stem at the bottom to have hardened off so I can actually cut it. And so that's why you tend to find hay crops are taller. But from a grazing perspective, Actually, that's where we want to be. And I don't know what that is. It's just that my hands go there. So, I, you know, it's that. That's what we want to go into a paddock and eat. About that. Now, if it's weaned lambs, probably about that. But that's about where we want to come into a lucerne stand to maximise the quality that we're eating. Um, we can have animal health issues, so our vaccination program has to be good. And um, I'm not an animal scientist, but people tell me a 7 and 1 is, is the best option for a lucerne situation. Um, B12 injections for if you've got a cobalt deficiency, and we don't flush on lucerne if we can avoid it in dull or wet weather, because these little spots here 
they cause uh, a compound in the lucerne to rise, and when it rises up, it's called chemistrol. It actually suppresses ovulation rate, so you don't get as many twins as you'd expect. And we may find that we get that this year because there was a lot of wet autumn. And if farmers use their lucerne, then they may find their scanning and lambing percentages are down a bit. But this is some recent PhD work. What we found was if you're in that situation, you can leave them on the lucerne until two weeks before the ram goes out. So they can be going through the winter, going through the summer, putting on weight, doing really well, and then two weeks before you want to put the ram out, they should be off the lucerne, and then you won't have a conception problem. Okay, once they're pregnant, they can go back on lucerne, no problem at all. It doesn't cause abortion, there's no issues with that. It's just that leaf disease from fungal causes it some problems. Um, Red gut, the fibre, that mowing helps in that situation. Bloat, we know about, it can always be an issue. I'm not going to say you won't get bloat. People do get bloat, and it's devastating when it happens. Okay? Sodium, we've talked about because we need... We need um, you might see sometimes animals go into a lucerne paddock in the, in the third paddock in the rotation, and they're just eating the fence line. It's often because they're eating the weeds because the weeds have got sodium in them because haven't, they haven't had access to sodium. Um, so, start when it's 15 to 20 centimetres tall, quality is maximised at 30 centimetres. The leaf and the soft part are the high quality stuff. Don't worry about the residual that's in a paddock once you've grazed it. It's of no consequence to the plant. It looks messy, so if you don't like a messy looking stand, you can go and trim it off, but otherwise it's of no consequence. Drop out paddocks if it's getting away. What you should be doing in a lucerne grazing in the spring is I'm grazing paddock four in my six paddock rotation. What does paddock one look like? I'm grazing paddock five, what does paddock one look like? Because I want to enter paddock one the second time when it's about 30 centimetres tall. So that's how you should be looking at your stand. There's no defined number of days grazing rotation, nothing like that. It's when do I get back to about 30 centimetres. And for us at Lincoln, sometimes that's been after 28 days, sometimes it's been after 35. Four to five weeks has been what we've required. When we started that short one, to when we get back onto the first paddock again the second time round. Um, we've talked about an extended period of autumn growth, and in some areas, if you've got a wet autumn, then use your grass for tupping, not your lucerne. And weed control, the wetter it is, then the weed control becomes really important. So that's sort of an overview of lucerne, and I'll take technical questions later if people have got them. I just wanted to give you an overall understanding of the plant, and then give you a little bit of case study stuff. So this is Doug Avery. Who's heard Doug speak? A number of you heard Doug speak. Well, he's retired, he's in town now. I'm going to visit him this weekend. My in-laws still live in Blenheim, so I'm off to visit my in-laws, and I'll go and see Doug, but I'll see him in town, and we'll have coffee instead of me driving out to the farm. But Fraser's still on the farm, and I'll go and visit Fraser. This is their story. This is the graph that really turned um, Doug's mind, was when I showed him this one and said, you know what, because of that remobilisation, plus the plant's never nitrogen deficient, in your limited bucket that you get there at Bon Avery and Marlborough, in the spring, you can do about 30 kilos of dry matter for every millimetre of water you've got in the soil, whereas your grass is only doing about 13. So all of a sudden, instead of producing two and a half tonnes per hectare in spring, you're producing six tonnes per hectare in spring. Because you've dealt with that nitrogen deficiency that I talked about earlier by having the legume in the system. And, and he got that, and he then started to understand that what he really was was a farmer of water, and it's maximising the use of the water that becomes important. When we talk about five mils of evapotranspiration, what that means is you've actually lost 50 tonnes of water from a hectare. You know, the process of photosynthesis is not about saving water, it's about getting carbon dioxide into the plant. To do that, it's got little holes that open and the water flies out. You can't change that, that's biology but we can maximise the use of that water by having nitrogen efficient plants in the system, particularly in spring. Hence my desire to have subclover in because it's our earliest growing legume. Um, that's 14th of August, so obviously lots of ewes and lambs around. And one of the things that we find is that you get hoggett mating as you put more weight, because those ewe lambs, oh, wrong way, go back again. Ewe lambs here will get mum's milk so they'll do 300 grams per head per day, and then they'll get straight lucerne, and it's much easier to get them up to 55 kilos by the time they come round. And so then you hog it mating. 
And we know that as you put weight on hoggets, you increase the percentage that you're going to get out of them. So the whole system starts to spiral up because you've got better grown ewe lambs right at that from that first um, period of growth when they're just born right through, they stay on the loose end and they're looking pretty good by the time you come to mating. Um, it's an example of them growing and just another example of, if you've, this is October and he's still cutting some strips in here because it's been raining. There's a 550 mil rainfall environment. On Doug's property, um, he increased the land area between 2002 and 2012. I stopped, he gave me the figures every year, but I stopped in 2012 because about then he started to lease a lot of land and take another farm on, etc. It became too complicated to try and do a, a true comparison between the systems. But over a decade, when I first sort of met Doug, he went from 1,100 hectares to 1,800. His sheep numbers went up a bit, about 12%. But the key thing was the performance. So we've got a 28% lift in lambing. We're no longer selling stores at 13.3. We're selling 19 kilo lambs that are going off prime. So we've got a 43% increase here. In total lambs sold, we've gone up almost 100%. Now I know we've got an increase in area of about a third to a half, but we've gone up 100% in terms of lamb production. Out of pretty much the same flock. And the return obviously being um, quite high. And for those of you that are interested, then he's, he's written a fairly good story um, that you might want to have a look at called The Resilient Farmer. One of the key things he says about that is it wasn't plain sailing. And so I wanted to illustrate that. Um, whenever you have a farm system, your farm system or whatever you're operating on, you know that system. So you've maximised that system and it's operating as well as it possibly can because wherever your farm is, after say five, six, ten years, you've got it as optimised as it can possibly be. So your ability to, have, to change it becomes limited. You already know where the animals should be on any given day or how much feed you're going to grow. You've optimised that farm pretty much. And so your system starts to plateau. And what we're talking about is how do we implement a new technology like lucerne grazing? Well, generally what we find is things go backwards. And for Doug, they went backwards quite quickly. But this is, you get a new car or you, whatever it is, you do something different, you start to play squash and you've never played before. You know, there's a down period here where you go backwards a bit. And it's always going to happen because you're trying something new. But what you're wanting is, look, if I keep on this path, I'm going to stay here. So I go backwards a bit, and then I've got potential to increase my output quite dramatically. That's what we talk about when we say transformational change. Incremental change is a little bit. Transformation is big output change. What agribusiness is, you know, there's a, a problem here, and this is, if you read Doug's book, that's sort of when I met him, um, when he was down here. You know, and it took a bit to come out. Um, and there's a risk of going backwards. Oh, this isn't going to work. So we have to minimise that, and hopefully that's what science, agribusiness, technology people are doing. That's their job, is to try and minimise that. But don't be scared if things don't work the first time you grow I don't know, a rape crop or a plantain red clover crop or whatever it might be that you try. You can't expect it to work as well as what you've been doing for 10 years because you don't know the nuances of that system. So you have to learn how to deal with that. And our job is to try and minimise this negative output and the risk of reversion. Um, from there, maybe the next thing is irrigation. And you can move to another, I'm not sure. Most guys that switch from a dry land to an irrigation actually have a problem. It doesn't, it's not plain sailing to first start putting an irrigator on. There's a lot of, prob a lot of things to learn. Keep an idea, keep a thought of that process as I show you the next case study. This is Bog Roy, 300, 400 mil rainfall in central, um, in the Mackenzie, at Odomatata, um, Gundy and Lisa Anderson. This is their property, and what happened is um, they had heard Doug's story in about 2008, and they were driving back from somewhere, and Lisa was a, a, a FERT rep for Ravensdown, and she came into my office because she was an ex-student, and she sat in my office, and we, she was asking me some questions. I can't even remember what the questions were. But Gandhi was sitting there sort of a bit bored, and he saw this handout that I'd had from a field day at Doug Avery's place. 
And so he grabbed that and he started reading it and then he just took over the conversation. He said, I heard about this guy, da, 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 da. and that was it. And, and I didn't know Gundy at all, but he told me what he was trying to do. And I said to him, well, actually, your farm system, your feed supply and animal demand don't match. You're trying to produce a whole lot of animals in the middle of January and February, and you don't have any feed. You have 400 mils of rainfall. Why aren't you grazing your lucerne? And that was about it. That was about the end of the conversation. Evidently from there, from Lincoln through to um, Omarima, he then just talked to Lisa the whole way home about what they were going to do and how it was going to change. So this is their story after 10 years. That was their old system. Set, stop, constantly chasing grass. Hill country going backwards because they're constantly up there looking for every blade of grass. 100 days supplementary feeding, peak demand and feed supply, completely misaligned. So what we did was try and implement what I call landscape farming. So we take the areas that are deeper soils and we put some lucerne in because that's where the water's going to run to. Why would I cultivate this? It's already hard and bony. I'll let the water run here and, and cultivate that area. And the first time the ewes and lambs went on, they got a phone call from the neighbour. The ewes and lambs have escaped into your lucerne paddock because in the high country it was traditionally cut and carried. So, you know, outside the box. Um, getting started, they had a little bit of lucerne, but starting the grazing was the big issue. And, and working out which bits of our landscape can we put lucerne into and, and utilise lucerne in there. Um, the best thing Gundy did was marry well, because Lisa was quite happy to cut cages and get some idea of how much they're actually producing. She was a numbers person, and um, her training had forced her to do that. So they got good support also. Pete Anderson, um, I think, with stock care, and they recorded the numbers. So in the last 12 months or so, I've just been able to go back and look at their numbers over time. What they found was kilograms of lamb weaned equals the number of lambs you've got times their weaning weight. So that's the key period we were looking for. How, much, how many kilos are you getting? And that depends on your scanning percentage, your lamb wastage, and your lambing. This is the key thing that changed. They decrease the lamb wastage. Merinos are not very good mothers, any of you that know anything about merinos, because they're generally being starved. So they give birth and say, thank God the parasite's gone. <laughs> and they walk away. But if they're fed well, then they might not walk so far and they might actually go back and inquire as to what that thing was that they just dropped. Or maybe two, look, now we've got two. So the lambing percentage, you know, lamb growth rate, etc. Um, you can see the 2008 system producing about 90, 90 tonnes of weaned lamb and then starting to get an increase from their grazing and then a bit more and then a bit more. Now, no reversion, I'd like to say that's because they had some intervention from good agribusiness and myself, so they didn't go backwards, but that's what happened. And you can see now the same property is essentially producing 150 tonnes of weaned lamb when it was producing 90. It's a 50% increase. And they've done that on a 400 mil rainfall environment. Um, and their ewes mated hasn't changed very much initially. So what you find is you don't have to change your stocking rate very much. You're just feeding animals better. How close are we? All right. OK, oh, that's good because I am too. <laughs> Putting the two together, you can see those steps and stairs, and that's their, their change. Um, their key take-home message, they listened to advice and acted on it. That was the key thing. They didn't just hear the advice, they actually listened to the advice and acted on it. So the Lucerne story has worked pretty well. It's defined a lot of systems. People are making money out of it. Um, the sheep milk, goat milk people, they're all wanting green chop Lucerne because they know it's the highest quality feed. And if you're making, if, you, if your product is milk, out of sheep, you need high quality feed to do that, and ryegrass can't. Um, I'll flick through that one, except to say that part, we knew 5 to 35 kilos in 100 days. The other plant we've been interested in and we're working on more at the moment is subclover. So this is the 11th of September at Ashley Dean, um, at Lincoln, and what we're finding is we're able to produce animals that are growing 300 grams per head per day very early. And within 100 days, I mean, Ashley Dean is essentially a gravel. For those of you that don't know it, it's a stone farm at Lincoln that they put some soil in. Pretty much what the dairy cows are on are most of the plains. There's not a lot of soil there. But within a three-month period, we are averaging 300, that's about 330 there, grams per head per day. 
And if you do that 300 grams per head per day, the time to go from 25 to 35 um, kilo live weight is about a month. Whereas if you're only doing 100 grams per head per day, it's three months. So you've got to have, animals growing fast have to get 22 megajoules per day. If I've got 12 megajoules from my lucerne, they need about two kilos of lucerne per day. That's what they need to eat to be able to do that. And then they're gone in a month. Um, from a subclover story, if you're interested in subclover, this is a Marlborough property, Tempalo, David and Joe Grigg, and their stuff is online on the Beef and Lamb website. And um, what they pretty much did was all through grazing management. David learned how to graze. He didn't even know he had subclover on the property when we visited. He didn't know it was there. And he grazed it properly. Gets that sort of pasture in the spring. And his values here saying he's gone from 60 to 76 tonnes of meat. All they did was put in stock water and fences so they could manage their subclover. No seed introduced in that. Sorry if there's any seed merchants here. But they just managed what they had and knew which legume was going to work in their environment. Um, you can have clover and sometimes it can be too short. So I just wanted to finish. Sometimes high quality feed is not good enough by itself. There needs to be intake. This is too short. And what you find, this is a sheep um, with an ME of 11 and a half, but a decent intake, so you can get decent intake here depending on what the herbage mass is. So you can't just have high quality feed, there's also got to be a decent amount of herbage. So my take home here is sometimes our pastures are too short and it's not the quality of pasture that's limiting our production, it's the intake. You've got to have both and that's why the lucerne works, that's why the subclovers work. And there I've done. Sorry. Um, that's okay. You're going to be about four weeks. I'm around, I'm around until the end of the day, so if people have got questions, I'm happy to answer them. How do we get this to go? Hello, hello. It is going. Hello. Question. Yeah, yeah thanks, Graham. Um, we looked at our place because we're in the Waimea Valley, and I see that it's got the greatest uh, change in climate, and so you're looking towards drier. Okay? Um, and I thought, great idea, we plant lucerne. Um, and then I looked around and there wasn't a paddock that didn't have field tiles in it that um, required um, some extra care with that. How bad is lucerne in field tiles? Um, I'd put the lucerne in and find out. <laughs> Very brave, I'll give you a ring. <laughs> so, so what we know is that the, it'll find them and it'll probably block them. But the advantage you get out of it, I suspect, will be worth the hassle, and I'd have a go. And I'd find um, the drier of the paddocks, obviously, northwest facing. If there's any slope at all, any contour, I'd go onto those contours first. Um, but the benefits are so great that I would give it a go. That would be my advice. And if I get it wrong, well, you've done a paddock, and I'm sorry. But unless, unless you do it, we're not going to know. How far, well, no, what, what is your, um, the, the highest rainfall that you can suitably grow lucerne in? Grow lucerne in? Um, it, rainfall is a misnomer. It's when does it rain, okay? So a lot of people think they've got 1,200 millimetre rainfall and go, well, you should be dairy farming. But actually it all falls in June and July and August. Actually what matters is how much rainfall do you get in October, November, December, January and February. If you have six weeks, eight weeks of dry, then it's worth putting lucerne in. It's worth having a go with a deep tap-rooted legume that will give you some summer production. If you've only got three weeks of dry, well most years you'll get through that. So the amount of rainfall doesn't matter, it's when it falls that really matters. Um, so you know, it's easy to say 400 mils in Odomatata, yeah, absolutely, you've got to do it. But I've got people at 1,000 mils of rainfall that are still doing lucerne because their bucket, they've got 
soil like this, it's already full. If they get another 200 mils of rainfall in August and September, it's not actually helping. So it's when it falls that matters. Because I've got the knowledge from Olivia. Yeah, just your, um, if your water table's at 20 metres and, and you're. 20 metres? Yeah. yeah. And your, um, your tap root's going down a metre and, it, and it's, you've got 10 weeks of dry, is, is it still beneficial? And, and you're farming on gravel. Oh, if you're farming on gravel, what else are you going to grow? Um, and I've had situations in, of, of people that sell the gravel ringing me to try and kill their lucerne because at the end of the loader going down to get the gravel, there were still lucerne roots at six metres. So it won't stop at a metre, it'll keep going down as long as there is moisture there. Now if the water table comes up, we don't know whether that will cut the, you know, if you've got a, a, a water table that goes up and down, but if it's just down there and you've got gravel, nothing else is gonna grow on it. So in that, that situation, I'd probably look at autumn sowing. But we can talk about that at morning tea because you're wanting to stop, at afternoon tea because you're wanting to stop. Um, and this other people need to talk. have to bring the session to a close. We've got people busting to get into the door. Um, just like you to thank Derek, please, in the normal sort of way. <laughs> it, it, it always, a, it, it's quite remarkable. You get the, the top flight speakers, they make um, reasonably complex sort of discussions, quite simple and easily understandable, and Derek's a real cracker at that. And just in addition to the round of applause, you can drink this on the aircraft on the way home. That's for you, and that's for you as well, and many thanks again, Derek. It's been a good. Thank you.